Hey guys, Youngblood with you for our 11th episode of Ask Youngblood Anything, the Inbox series. And we're going to go ahead and just jump on into it with a question from Bego Bogo. It says, will shop owning be a career so you can buy out a small property and source items from all over the galaxy in your shop? Um, I don't know what the overall plan is here. I'm not sure if they want to institute something like this. But my hunch says that how immersive everything in this game is set to be, that I do think this will end up being something that you can do. We know that the ships like the uh, Banu Merchantman are set up to actually be able to set up a shop in space. So the mechanics of having the ability to kind of own your own business is going to be there to some extent. And we know you're going to be able to buy um, different things or rent different locations on uh, planets like, you know, apartments and stuff. That's all built in and planned. So I would assume that there is going to be some way that you can actually do this. Um, but how that's actually going to play out and what that's going to look like in the end is going to be hard to say. Um, you also asked, uh, I want to ask you if you think that uh, Star Citizen and Squadron 42 will get an age rating. If so, what do you think it will be? Um, I think uh, Star Citizen, the Persistent Universe, is probably not going to be rated. Um, or if it does, it might get an M rating, probably because um, you can't control interactions with other players and what it's actually people are going to say. And we know people say some pretty filthy stuff. So um, I would assume that either gets unrated or it gets an M. Uh, for Squadron 42, it may get a uh, teen rating. Um, I think that's the lowest it would get, but depending on the type of dialogue that they have in the campaign, it may get an M. So it's probably going to be T or M, but those are my guesses there. Um, and before I go to this next question, I should probably let you know that apparently I've had too much caffeine and I am just flying right now. So there's going to be a little extra energy in this delivery today. Uh, Stoner Leprechaun says, what do you think would be a, gr a good and fast smuggling ship? That all depends on the type of item that you're trying to smuggle. You know, if you're trying to smuggle information on a little thumb drive in your pocket, um, I would say A350 or whatever the fastest ship out there is. Because if nobody can catch you, it's going to be really hard to do anything. Now, the tricky thing is we know that at landing locations, there's going to be scanners. Um, you know, we, we see that even in uh, Art Corp right now. So you could have the fastest ship in the galaxy but if you get there and your ship is essentially transparent which a racing ship might be um, that device that you're carrying may end up being picked up so other ships may end up serving a better purpose like maybe you could shield a uh, cutlass and have a little smuggling compartment we know that there's a, a shielded compartment in the constellation taurus so if you're carrying uh, you know two thousand pounds of normal goods and twenty pounds of illicit goods but those twenty pounds are in a smuggling compartment they may not even think to look in that other place because they're so focused on checking out your legitimate cargo. So I don't think there's really going to be a best smuggling ship, but depending on what you're trying to do, either something fast or something that's shielded, and we know that there's going to be a couple um, that stand out. A freelancer is another one. They talk about a shielded uh, cargo bay in the freelancer commercial. So if that ends up holding up, the freelancer then probably is going to find that nice middle ground of a decently fast ship with uh, decent cargo capacity and the shielded technology. Uh, Emilio Sandoval wants to know, will there be any NPCs that will be robots, like androids or cyborgs? I don't think there will be. Um, I think they want to really keep this a player-driven galaxy, even if those players are NPCs. Um, there's also things built into the lore about AI and how AI went wrong and is evil and people don't want to, uh, you know, really trust it. So I don't think we're going to see that. Um, or if we do, it may end up being some like in-game mission, like some AI went crazy and you have to stop them. But it shouldn't probably be expected to be anything outside of, you know, dealing with maybe like the consoles or some some pseudo robots or AI, but I guess I should say robots or androids, but you're probably not going to see the artificial intelligence piece because that seems to be what's really been condemned by the lore. Um, Trombonage, great name, says, hey Youngblood, I had this idea for a career, is basically a civilian carrier where you transport people's ships uh, for them. Do you think it's a good idea? And if so, what ship would be ideal for this task? I think it's a great idea. Um, I think we're going to be limited based on the pocket carrier restrictions. Um, everybody in this universe wants to get a pocket carrier of some fashion. Now, I think what we could do, and I think what we've heard a little bit of, is when we talk about ships like the whole E and the whole D, the big whole series, they do have the capability, or are supposed to have the capability, of being able to carry ships. Now, you shouldn't be able to launch ships off of them, but taking them from point A to point B could end up being a possibility. So it's more like shipping a car on a cargo boat, or shipping a car on a railroad. 
um, you know, you're not necessarily going to drive your car off the boat or the, off the railroad. Um, it's just taking it from point A to point B. I think that's an aspect that we'll see, and I absolutely think that could be a good career, especially as players start getting spread out and having hangers in different locations. You know, I'm not necessarily going to want to have to take, you know, my Sabre back to Terra from Seoul because I wanted to get my Freelancer leave my saber there and then take my freelancer that if i'm trying to operate in a different part of space then i may end up wanting to get my ships there so if that ends up being the case this service would be outstanding now the other alternative to this would be things like the genesis starliner or just hitching a ride with another player maybe you want a sweet ride so you end up hopping in a uh, constellation phoenix something to that extent I think there's going to be different ways to get you to where you need to be or bring what you need to you, um, but I think we're going to need to see more fleshed out as far as how that's actually going to look in-game. Uh, let's see. Uh, George Mirror says, I have the 315 and a Reliant Core, and I'm thinking of melting them down to get a Freelancer of some sort. Um, do you think that would be a good move? Um, I do think that would be a good move, um, <laughs> specifically because I think if you were able to get yourself into a freelancer Dur, um, you're probably going to be carrying more cargo than the Reliant can. You're going to be able to probably go longer distances and um, you know, just do more as far as exploration goes in the Dur, um, and then you're only having to worry about one ship. Now the downside to that is if you're only going to start with one ship in the game, um, that ship is your money maker and if you for some reason crash it and it takes a couple days to get an insurance claim in then you're a little bit boned that being said um, I guess the other thing to consider is if you want like just a fighter maybe sticking with those two is going to cover your bases pretty well because the 315 could be equipped pretty similarly to the uh, 325 not including the armor um, Reliant Core should be able to be a fairly decent fairly nimble type of ship um, but if you do want something that's just a more overall capable ship, I am a huge fan of the Freelancer Dur. Um, or you could just go with the base Freelancer and do some upgrades on that ship once we get the ability to in-game. Uh, 56K says, please brainstorm on this topic for me. Um, it's kind of a long question, but talks about how DayZ had the intentions of be putting in mechanics that would allow friendly interactions between players. But in DayZ, people basically just kill on sight because it's the safest thing to do considering you can't trust anybody. Um, he goes on to say that the developers fell well short on that and it pushed, uh, it just kind of went in a bad direction. So CIG... Um, says that they want to do the same thing, like using VoIP and a robust reputation system to keep player interactions in place. Um, but do you think it's going to be enough? What else can be done? Basically, that sort of thing. So, uh, 50, I think this is a complicated topic, but I think we can look to other games as a pretty good example. Um, when there's consequences in the game for being the one that shoots first, I think it makes things a little bit more intuitive in this regard. Um, when I look at like Elite Dangerous, for example, most people weren't shooting at other people first. I mean, even pirates weren't typically doing that. You'd pull them out in, after an interdiction, and then you would normally try and talk to them about dropping their cargo through threats. Um, I don't think you... Now, I don't play Daisy, so it's hard for me to really say, but the videos I've seen, it seems like people just see another player and kill them to make sure that they're not dying. <laughs> Um, I don't think we're going to see that because there's probably going to be automatic bounty systems that are in place if you do something like that. And just based on other games that I've played like this, and again, going back to Elite Dangerous, you aren't typically taking that approach. You're cautious around other players, which I think you're going to see in this game as well. Um, but I don't necessarily think that there needs to be additional things that are worked into the game outside of what's already planned, like bounty systems picking up a... Um, you know, fines, those types of things. I think it can probably regulate itself. And then the other thing is with the reputation system they're putting into the game, um, you're going to be able to actually see what sort of other events the other player has been wrapped up in in the past. Meaning that if you are um, rolling up and you see player B off in the distance and you're like, okay, player B, what are you all about? And you pull him up on your Moby Glass or your ship's computer and you find out that he's a sh guy that's wanted because he's killed three other people you're probably going to take a much different approach than somebody that has nothing but positive reviews. So I think there's going to be enough tools in place regarding what they already plan to do, not to mention just the general mechanics of the game, to where it's probably not going to end up in that daisy situation. There's always going to be players that shoot first, but I don't necessarily think that's going to be the norm. 
Shadow Guardian says, um, two questions. First, do you think it'll be harder to play Star Citizen in general and play in organizations like your own or limited on a limited schedule, i.e. being limited to a weekday weekend play or only having a few hours free at a time? Um, to answer that question, you're not that far off from myself. Um, you know, I'm one of the leaders of the organization, um, but you know, I think that's one of the benefits of actually having a large organization. If you're playing solo or playing in a small group and you have limited hours, there's a good opportunity or a good possibility that there's not going to be a lot of other people online to play with you at that same time. If you get involved with a big organization, you've got people worldwide in much different schedules um, who, in, ranging from people like yourself who don't play very often to people that play constantly, um, you have a much better shot of actually being able to interact and work as a team. Uh, secondly, do you think that there's going to be an option in-game to side against the UEE on a more large-scale setting, turning against the main human government or siding with the non-human uh, non governments? I'm not sure where this is going to go. Um, I think that there's probably going to be pirate organizations that try and overthrow the government or maybe just try and capture large ships because they want to get on a bangle. Um, I don't know how much is this is going to be feasible in the game. If it's feasible, people are absolutely going to do it. And it might be kind of cool to start a revolution and try and overthrow governments. One thing you really need to remember is, is that the player base is 10% of the overall galaxy. So it doesn't matter how many people are playing. Let's say there's 10 million people, or I guess let's say we're, yeah, 10 million people, then there's going to be 90 million uh, NPCs in the galaxy. And those numbers are obviously really low. We probably need to uh, adjust that, but that's the general idea. So even if every player in the game decides that they want to overthrow the government, it's still 10 versus whatever percentage of 90% are actually good inside with the military and the government. So I don't, I'm not sure how effective this would be, but they do want to make sure that players can have some impact on things like the economy. So you could technically try and um, knock out supply lines and starve people out and do those types of things. Uh, let's see. Gobuzu, Gobuzu. Sorry if I messed that up. Uh, will or does your organization have a dedicated group for search and rescue and medical aspects of the game? Um, we're still kind of developing what our organization is going to look like as far as how we break things out. Um, we do have a lot of uh, Cutlass Reds. Uh, I've got one as well. We've got Endeavors with the Hope uh, set up. So yes, there is going to absolutely be that. And sometimes those ships are going to be used to support our operations, but sometimes we're also going to try and focus on that type of operation. So it's, we don't necessarily have like a medical wing, at least yet, um, but we do have the ships and the people that are interested to play that type of support role. Uh, Charles U. Farley says, love the work, mate. Thank you, Charles. Um, how do you think assassinations could or will work? Um, I think I need a little bit more information to flesh this out, but let's go through two different situations. Um, if we're talking about assassinating other players, I think you just kill them and deal with taking on um, you know, the bounty and the risk and the being wanted status. Um, th that being said, if you do that in like unmonitored space, at least if they, things hold up like they are in 2.3 right now, um, then you're not going to be picking up any warrant or anything like that. If you're talking about actual government officials, boy, that's going to be hard. I mean, you could maybe do it. Um, I don't know if you're going to have a chance to interact with them in first person, um, but you could potentially see a ship like, I don't know, UEE-1, um, you know, flying around and maybe try and attack it and blow that up. Um, but I don't know enough to really answer that question for you. And Mr. Pro Gamer says, Dear STL Youngblood, I'd like to know how fast-paced a capital ship battle would be. I'm a huge real-time strategy gamer and would love to own a ship like the Idris and command other ships in a fleet. However, how long do you think such a massive battle would last? Um, and also, how easily do you think it would be to take an Idris down, e.g. how many hornets would it take to destroy an Idris? So I think it's going to be interesting because I think it's going to be fast-paced and slow. A ship like the Idris isn't going to turn on a dime. It's going to be much different than a ship like a Hornet. Um, you know, when you start talking about capital-class ships, you know, you can't... Sh maybe the ship is capable of turning really quickly, um, but what it does to the inside of the ship is very devastating to the people. You know, there's a ton of G-forces and a lot of mass, and it would be really hard to keep things balanced. So those ships are going to have to move slowly. That being said, there's so many parts of the ship, like things like, um, you know, engineering. You know, you may have to run halfway across the Idris to go fix something that broke during that battle. 
Um, you know, if somebody gets killed, like in a, uh, I don't know, in a turret somewhere, uh, maybe a bullet somehow went through the turret, but the turret was still operational, maybe somebody needs to run and get into that turret. You're also going to have massive amounts of communication happening from the captain to the engineering department to the person on the command and control module to shields to weaponry. That sort of communication is going to make things very hectic, especially when you have a massive battle taking place around you. So from that perspective, I think it's going to be very fast-paced. Um, but how many hornets would it take to destroy an Idris? Boy, I, that is a hell of a question. Um, they, they say that one constellation is equivalent to three hornets, a fully crewed constellation and three hornets. Um, I personally, if things stay the way they are right now and the turrets don't necessarily improve, it's probably closer to 2 to 1. Um, but if you're talking about that 3 to 1 ratio for a constellation, if that's the goal, and you're talking about an Idris, I mean, you could probably quadruple it. I mean, maybe you're talking 10 to 20 uh, Hornets to take down an Idris. We don't really know. And I think what I need to see is more about how that turret convergence actually is and where the turrets are placed to get a better idea. Um, but I think it's going to be a lot, especially when you consider that the Idris can carry uh, three to four fighters on it. Um, you know, that automatically negates some of that fleet. So maybe that 10 to 20 number actually becomes 15 to 25 or something like that. So um, there's a lot of factors to consider with that, but it's going to be a hard thing to kind of answer. So that's going to be it. Um, I'm going to try and make these a little bit shorter and just do them a little bit more frequently because this 1440p footage takes forever to render. Um, I appreciate you guys dealing through my uh, high energy approach this time. <laughs> um, but if you have questions for this series, please get them in. Um, I'll try and work through them. I'm probably about five videos behind on getting to the questions, but I'm committed to continue working through them. So uh, have yourselves a wonderful day. I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.